What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Tech One Two podcast. I'm joined in the studio today with a very special guest, me, Luis Geraldo from ScalePad. All right, so let's get started. All right, welcome to the Tech One Two podcast. Today we have a very special guest in the studio today. I'm glad we were able to make it happen. We have Lu- Luis Geraldo from ScalePad in the studio. Welcome, man. Man, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me out. Uh, beautiful office, by the way. And I'm geeking out a bit over this uh, sort of dedicated, uh, purpose-built podcast room. It's awesome. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I'm so glad we were able to make this happen. You being in Chicago, it just worked out. I know you're very busy traveling all over the world, but having you in the studios today is truly a privilege and a uh, privilege for our, our viewers as well. It's my absolute pleasure, man, for sure. Man, so what, what brings you into uh, Chicago now? Well, we, uh, we have the CompTIA CCF event, um, which is an annual event in March, and they, they always do it here in Chicago. And they're, you know, headquarter, the community is headquartered here in Chicago. And so we had a number of team members come out, uh, and it's just one of the things that we do. Part of my uh, construct inside of the vendor space is to contribute as a volunteer to the CompTIA program. And for many years as an MSP, I was a member, uh, Scalepad is a corporate member, of course. Um, I sit on one of the advisory councils. And so CCF is sort of this great gathering of the minds. A lot of the work for the programs and uh, initiatives that CompTIA is working on gets sort of hashed out during some of the working sessions at CCF. And it's just a good place to connect and network with a lot of industry folks that maybe don't make it out to the the usual uh, suspect vendor events. But uh, this seems to be uh, definitely a little bit of the cross-section of MSPs, people that are on those interest groups and working groups, and, of course, a bunch of folks from the vendor community as well. Yeah, no, I love it. Thank you for, I mean, having you in, in Chicago, you see what we did for the on the weather for you? Yes, I, you know, um, I was impressed because I was looking at it on my phone <laughs> last week before coming. I was like, do I need a jacket? Do I need an Arctic jacket? What's <laughs> going to be happening in Chicago next week? And it was uh, incredibly, it looked really, really comfortable, and it's been absolutely beautiful throughout the day, so appreciate the extra effort you uh, you, brought, you did for me there. We made it happen. We made it happen. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, every there are so many people in the industry that know you. I mean, and especially just by first name, you're like, oh, Luis. Oh, I know who Luis is. But you've got this wide range of experience in our space. I mean, everything from doc- documentation tool, which was acquired by IT Glue, to running your own MSP, now at ScalePad, you have this wide breadth of knowledge and experiences. Tell us a little bit about how all these experiences have influenced what you're doing today. Oh man, I it's something that I've I've started thinking a lot about in the recent years. Just this idea of like transplanting mental models from you know one potential swim lane of life to another, uh, because you know it's interesting. The IT industry, you see people come into it from all walks of life, you know. And I, in fact, I meet a lot of musicians that come into IT, you know, later in life, uh, or people that are making a full career pivot and moving into IT. And I think IT is kind of one of those interesting industries that can be all things to all people. Mm-hmm. There's just, you know, the need for all the different um, disciplines of business inside of the IT space, uh, both the MSP side and the, the vendor side. So it's been super interesting. For me, it was kind of, um, happenstance uh, shift into IT. You know, I was a professional musician pretty much my whole life, uh, toured professionally, and I was spent a, a bunch of years on the cruise ships. And, um, you know, I used to pop into this Mac store in Vancouver, Simply Computing, and I just love to go in and see what's new, you know, kick the tires on the laptops and dream of the next thing I was maybe going to be able to afford at one point. And uh, on one of those visits, they kind of just offered me a job. They're like, hey, we had somebody quit, moved to Japan. Would you be interested in a retail job? And I'm like, oh, my God, that sounds like a dream opportunity. I was ready to get rid of the the music uh, cruise ship thing because it was starting to get a little tired. Um, Because the thing about cruise ships is you kind of like go on this multiverse, you know, parallel life. Everybody else is over here. Their lives are continuing. You go on the cruise ship and you come back almost to the same point where you left (laughs) because your relationships have not evolved. Your life has not evolved. And so it's really tough to be away on the cruise ships for a long, long period of time. So I was kind of wanting to get out of the cruise ships and just kind of restart my life in Vancouver. And I took the job and, and I turned out to be pretty good at the retail sales thing. Um, although it was it was peer based selling, I just sort of was passionate about the technology, and I was the music guy uh, of the store. And so they would send anybody that came in ask about music setups or music systems. Uh, that was also the age of GarageBand, 
back in the day. Um, I had a certification in Logic Pro, all the production oh. software. And then I, I went and took a course to, to get trained on Logic Pro, Apple's production software they bought from a company in Germany called eMagic. And um, I discovered that there was these server courses. And it was, you know, client network things and learning about networks and learning about servers and directories and all this stuff. And I just got really curious. And I remember um, after I left that job, I was fired for insurrection. <laughs> <laughs> of all the things people get fired, I was fired for insurrection. I just, you know, I was um, opinionated and all the things that, that you know about me already. Uh, but I, I sort of immediately turned into uh, doing residential consulting. I actually, you know, I buried all the hatches and I went back to the Simply Computing folks. And I said, how about I offer you guys a setup and delivery service? And it was the, the time frame of the big uh, IMAX. They were now oh, the yeah. flat screens, but yeah. they were pretty heavy back then. And nobody wanted to carry them home. Nobody wanted to set them up. And so I was doing all these deliveries and setups and all those customers became regular customers. Some of them started bringing me into their businesses. <laughs> And uh, before you knew it, I was just kind of, you know, a little consultancy had been born. And I went back to California and did the training on the server stuff. And that's kind of how I started to cement my interest in, in the business IT stuff and the network stuff. Um, and then, you know, fast forward five years, I sold the business to Fully Managed, which was a Canadian MSP uh, founded by Chris Day. Yeah, Chris Day. And, um, and I, I was there for about a year and ended up leaving again, just wanted to do my own thing. Uh, but at this point, I started sort of building out the, the proof of concept for a documentation platform, and I launched this thing called Monkeybox. Uh, and Monkey, Monkeybox was a great exercise because I brought on a business partner. I, I felt the need. I need to share documentation. Meanwhile, Chris had sort of stopped focusing on the MSP so much, and it started IT Glue. Mm -hmm. And he just went rocket ship with that stuff. He knew exactly how to position it and launch it in the market. Um, and about four years later, 2017, uh, he approached me and said, hey, you know, it'd be great to have somebody with your MSP experience help run the product. And so I came over to IT Glue as VP of product yep. in 2017 and, you know, spent the next three years in sort of that uh, big growth phase of IT Glue, uh, where documentation transitioned from mm, optional to mandatory, pretty much. Yeah. It was a super interesting time in the industry because, you know, I feel like a lot of new things kind of go through that transition, right? Uh, you go through this education period, MSPs can maybe uh, dispense with it if they're not focused on it too much. But documentation, it was kind of four years of education, and then all of a sudden everybody needed it. Uh, so that was kind of the, the rocket ship stage for IT Glue, and a great time. Um, yeah, and so that was kind of, I, you know, I, I kind of rolled into the entire history there, but uh, no, that was great. a bit of the genesis of, you know, the vendor side, you know, from 2013 and the IT Glue acquisition. Um, but also sort of a bit of the MSP. And so throughout my career now on the vendor side, I kept the MSP and I was still, you know, operating the MSP. Um, I had a couple business partners, brought one on 2013, another one 2017. And it was just sort of this small organic thing by design. Um, and then uh, Fully Managed again approached us in at the end of 2021. We started working on a deal. They themselves got acquired by TELUS, and so they went to you know a public company. Still in Canada. Still in Canada. Yeah. Um, and then we had to do you know a pretty hefty due diligence process mm -hmm. now with the with the public uh, entity to complete sort of that sale. So I, I get to say I sold my company to the same company twice, <laughs> effectively, which is kind of funny. Uh, and that sale completed in 2022, and I had a one-year sort of integration thing as I exited the business. And yeah, by the end of May of last year, I was kind of finally done with the MSP, and now I've transitioned uh, mentally and psychologically to just exclusively the vendor side. Yeah, so on the vendor side, I mean, that's an amazing history um, from 20, 2013, correct? When yeah, you started everything just about, yeah. to where you are today, and now you're the chief experience officer at ScalePad. Um, all these, all these experiences that you've had uh, working in the MSP space, both, um, I mean, well, first, just identifying the need of documentation. I think you were definitely a pioneer for that. You, you decided to start building a documentation platform, which we know today that is an integral part of process within an MSP. It's so important, mm -hmm. the documentation piece of it. To where you are today at ScalePad and just in the community, you know, you mentioned a bit about community and space and vendors. You've been on the MSP side and now on the vendor side. Uh, how important do you believe community is within our space? Oh, incredibly important. Uh, I, if, you know, if I had to just put a, a label on it, I'd say it's the bedrock of our space in many ways. Um, not just, you know, the vendors themselves, you know, because in the channel, as we call it, you know, the vendors, obviously we see each other all the time 
at the events and you know over the years of seeing the same folks over and over and over again uh, these there are deep roots and relationships that are built through that of course I had somebody tell me uh, just this morning is like oh you know your CEO Dan Wesley he's probably one of the people that I can honestly say I've known the longest in this space I've known him for 23 years or something like that wow. and so it's one of those things that it's just kind of becomes part of the identity in many ways um, and, and it's so cool at the same time, like the MSP vendor to MSP community is super important as well. So I think it's one of the things that, that helps MSPs uh, and their vendors get better. Um, as you know, MSPs do a lot of peer group type of work mm-hmm. and they, they are, have these accountability sessions and they work together to try and you know raise that bar as much as they can. Uh, but they also help keep vendors accountable, which I think is an important part of the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, community is a big part of it. And, you know, I was talking about this with MJ, uh, this morning, MJ Shore, the chief community officer, um, at CompTIA, because I felt like I was given a hand when I was starting my business. Um, I remember I, I popped on the Apple consultants network locator and this, this guy, uh, Mark and Cohen out of Vancouver just randomly calls me up and says, Hey, I noticed you're, um, on the locator and, uh, who are you? What's up? And, you know, let's get together. And it was completely unexpected, um, unnecessary, you know, from my perspective, like why would potentially a competitor be calling me to, you know, to build a relationship? But it was literally just that. He just had this very strong sense of wanted to work with other peers and uh, and share ideas. Um, and so from a very early stage in my own professional career, I feel like this real strong sense of community was instilled. And um, and I don't know, I've always felt sort of this need to, to pay it forward in a way. Mm-hmm. And that's part of, of why I volunteer my time for CompTIA and, and work on these programs to help MSPs get better. And so, man, that's a deep topic, yeah. I think. But uh, I just, to, to summarize, community is just so important, I feel. Yeah, yeah. I agree. In, in our space, we see, and we've used this term, coopetition. And I think, like, we go into these events and, you know, this community event that um, is taking place here in Chicago we go into these events not necessarily that this is competition we're looking to how we can cooperate how we can learn from each other and having that open-minded i think is so important because it only makes the industry stronger as a whole yeah i think it's the last few years it's been more and more evident um that there is no like secret sauce i mean we're not talking about seven spice secret (laughs) recipes here right the majority of MSPs just suffer from lack of execution and process. lack of a process. Yeah. And these are not secrets of state uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And so I do see more of this conversation around, hey, let's let's share information. Uh, and I think as MSPs come into the into the industry and, and, and are recipients of this knowledge and this sharing, I think it creates that flywheel of them wanting to do that for the next generation and so on. So I think we're sort of at this interesting inflection point of, of that flywheel just picking up a ton of really good inertia. Um, and at the same time, we have obviously the cybersecurity challenge that is uh, plaguing you know every small business and every MSP everywhere. Uh, but you know you hear this term, you know, raise the tide uh, mm-hmm. for all boats, and, and you see so much co- collaboration and cooperation between vendors, between MSPs, that are even in the same city uh, and potentially be competition, uh, there's there's plenty of work for everybody. And so I see more people realizing that and just wanting to work together more, which has been incredible. It has been incredible uh, being in this space and just being involved in that. You know, love being able to collaborate with other peers in our space, yeah. and it only makes us better. I'm in full agreement there. Um, you know, you mentioned the point of just giving back to the community, and you've invested a significant amount of time. I mean, you mentioned the event that you're at today, you travel all over the place, many different conferences, and a lot of it's educational, and you're giving back, and you're trying to help these other partners of yours grow. Um, What have you seen as far as, like, big differentiators between companies within the MSP space today um, that have been successful and ones that have not so much? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that we just literally had Carolyn April from CompTIA deliver a State of the Channel presentation yesterday morning and she had a, a couple of really interesting data points in fact let me pull one up because uh, I sent it over to my or to my marketing team and I thought this is a really interesting sort of change of dynamic of like how IT companies are starting to work um, and realize where they need to spend their time and so let me give you I an saw example. you taking a picture yeah I yeah. took a few yeah. and so so they, they compared uh, the traits of uh, firms performing better than two years ago 
and so it's an interesting sort of time uh, comparison because I feel like sometimes a one year time does time frame doesn't really give you a ton of insight um, or is not necessarily reliable. But now this is over two years, and so they talked about the the seventy nine percent of the MSPs that are in in better shape than two years ago uh, employed a CFO or some equivalent financial professional which I thought was a fascinating discussion because we've known for a long time, you know, the average MSP is pretty small, about seven people. But at the same time, this comes with some inability to deploy, you know, thorough financial processes into the business uh, or even manage, you know, payroll <laughs> effectively yeah. for that matter. And so, but it's also sort of that, that forward thinking on financial strategy, um, packaging and pricing, like a CFO plays at a small MSP plays such an important role. I mean, you have a great CFO at, uh, with Nick at mm -hmm. Empist, and so maybe you can color a bit of that conversation with some of the incredible value Nick brings to your organization, but, but this was interesting. One of the other um, uh, data points here was the 30% of the MSPs that were better in, in better shape than two years ago were had described their risk tolerance for borrowing, investing, or hiring as high. Hmm. meaning they're willing to sacrifice, m put more on the line in order to drive the needs of the business from a talent perspective than the ones that weren't. And you see this play out just in the echo chambers, like, oh, you know, um, we're not ready to hire yet. And what happens is, you know, they you squeeze the capacity of your current team and that creates further challenges. And so there are some folks that are clearly doing that. And this also, uh, I had a conversation with Kevin Nangani from uh, IT Partners Plus the hmm. other day because he kind of painted the pictures like, well, we were building an outbound team instead of our MSP. And uh, we realized we're gonna have to invest pretty much a year's worth of salaries to even build the sales outbound organization without expecting any potential returns until at least a year from now. Yeah. So super interesting data points. And I think MSPs are cluing into some of these things that they need to start doing if they wanna really get into this mindset of growth. So that's just a couple, yeah. but but there's a number of, of things sort of in that um, avenue that, that are interesting to, to talk about. Yeah, I think, you know, you look at this forward-looking investments that you need to uh, that you need to invest back into the business. You mentioned the CFO. Oftentimes, you know, it might be the business owner who thinks he can manage all the finances mm -hmm. internally, but, you know, a big difference for us is knowing our numbers. Knowing our numbers and having accuracy over our numbers so that you can make strategic decisions based on where you're currently at and projections. A CEO who's running an MSP is probably doing 10 other things as yeah. well. So you know yeah. that there's a lack of focus on that piece of the business. And I really look at it as there's four pillars within just your business. I mean, you have your finance operations, you have your people operations, you have your sales operations and marketing operations, and they all have to come together in kind of the core. And if you, if you disregard or neglect one of those areas, that's going to cause and potentially wreak havoc for the organization or get you to a point where you reach a break point within your business. And instead of pushing through that break point to get to the next level, you're going to take, you know, you're going to fall back and then you're going to be starting over and mm. over again. So it's interesting because, uh, I was just realizing that the, the measuring stick in so much of the MSP industry in the early stages of, of building an MSP is, you know, I want to get to a million dollars of revenue. But that could mean so many different things. That could mean, you know, 20 employees with a very inefficient company, mm -hmm. and it could mean three employees. Uh, in my case, it was two, um, with complete inability to deploy middle management or or grow the business or or the other aspects of sort of growing. And it, it occurred to me that it would be a super interesting thing to change the dynamic of the measuring stick to the, you know, we want to institute middle management, we want to have a service desk manager, we want to have financial controls. Um, that's a, a much more powerful sort of goal to hit in, instead of, and you realize obviously revenue is going to drive the capability to do mm -hmm. that. But it's a very different mental dynamic, I think, of, of saying, I want to plan my growth of the org chart by design and say, we need to have a CFO here by the end of the year, as opposed to we want to hit, you know, this magical $1 million in revenue, which may not necessarily translate into we need a CFO. And so, I, I don't know, it's interesting to think about sort of shifting a bit of the priority of the goals to these, you know, people-based outcomes, which is, I think, the path to growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, in our space, you mentioned kind of the, you know, the seven, seven employee shop average, you know, smaller MSPs. Um, you mentioned CFO. You, what, what about on the sales side? You know, obviously you ran your own MSP. You've been involved. You've done every part of what the mm -hmm. business needed. I'm sure you uh, filled every role at some point, one time, one point or another within the business. Um, I see that sales sales and marketing are often overlooked 
within our space. It's, you know, okay, we're going to live by referrals. We're just going to, you know, we're going to get the referrals, which are great when clients are promoting you and providing you those referrals. But that only takes you to a certain point. For someone who's trying to grow as an MSP, how important would you say sales and marketing are to an organization's growth? I love this topic because I feel like for the longest time, um, we've been proud almost like badge of honor. I've never spent a dime on marketing. We've all only grown through referral. And I think there's a glass ceiling to that for sure. Like there's there's a velocity that you start to need as a business if, if you're really focusing on growth. And uh, and referrals are not going to cut it, I think, once they you sort of have that. Get you to a certain point. Yeah, they get you to, what got you here is not going to get you there for sure. Um, and so I think one of the biggest mistakes I see that happen in the marketing is just not being patient and consistent enough to sort of create a strategy and deploy the, the tool sets and the things that you want to do uh, in the strategy and then and be patient for that to sort of start having the effect. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people in this space are impatient, understandably so, you know, sense of urgency and all that. And so sometimes, you know, oh, that, you know, Google campaign didn't work uh, after three months, we yeah. pull it. But that's never going to work in three months. You got to, this is, people have to see it and you have to create a bit of that space for your brand and your um, narrative and all those things in, in your market. And so some of those things take a year plus of, mm-hmm. of consistent posting. Uh, and I can't tell you the number of MSP owners I talked to is like, we're going to do a newsletter, you know, and they do one newsletter and then, you know, shit hits the fan again and they're busy and now they can't do the newsletter. So I think there's a, a clear need to have dedicated resources doing a proper strategy around marketing. And don't get me wrong, some MSP owners are super sales marketing focused and they love that stuff and they're great at it yep. and they succeed. They can build a sales org literally single handedly. Um, but for the technical folks that prefer to be sort of on the technical side or, or doing VCIO or that kind of stuff, they really do need to get the help for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm in agreement. I mean, s- sales and marketing. Marketing, I think, you know, is senior to sales. I mean, people need to know who you are or you can't service them. Yeah. Um, and it really starts that process. But the consistency of that, doing it over time and not expecting immediate gratification. Mm-hmm. I did a, I did one newsletter, it didn't work. Nobody was calling me because of the newsletter. And setting those expectations or doing the Google Ads campaign, like you mentioned, after three months and they didn't see a, a positive ROI and they're pulling the plug, it has to be about the consistency piece of it in order to get yeah. through that. Now, I think, you know, there's a page to be taken from a, a lot of the things that we see creators doing, which I find super interesting to think about. Um, and, you know, this podcast is a good example. My live stream is a good example. Like, I, I'm, it's kind of this interesting uh, effect of marrying uh, a tangential marketing uh, effect that it has to be out there doing the, the weekly live stream or your podcast. But, but the primary driver is, hey, we want to have interesting conversations. We want to give some value back to our networks and the community. And that's the thing that's driving us doing this. And it just happens to have this interesting effect that people like take the value and they understand now they know who you are or who I am. And this creates a little bit of that, that marketing effect of you know brand recognition or individual recognition or what have you. And I feel like MSPs could be doing a ton of this really, really well. Um, you know, get into your customers' industries and understand, you know, what the business and technology world is doing in those verticals and then talk about that. Um, I think a lot of um, technical owner operators make the mistake of talking about their technology, which is not interesting to their customers. <laughs> and so I think this is a, a bit of the challenge. We've got to bridge that gap and cross that over to that side of like, what are the customers that we're serving interested in hearing about? Um, and maybe trying a little bit of that. And this is, I, I think, the space where yeah, there are some young marketing folks that are just so tapped into how consumption is is happening right now on social media, on LinkedIn or what have you. And and obviously we're transitioning business ownership to the new generation. Yeah. The millennials are taking over. Uh, it'll be the Zennials down, you know, 20 years from now. But, you know, the boomers are kind of not interested in making any changes to their businesses anymore. Um, and so even though you might feel like marketing to them because they've got the money, they may not be willing to work with you on any changes that are necessary to bring their businesses up to the, the baseline yeah. par that's needed for today's cybersecurity requirements and everything else. So it's a kind of a interesting catch-22, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right. The Well, just thinking about it from the generational standpoint, you said, you know, even just marketing to the baby boomers, 
you have to market to different generations. It isn't just the generation that you were originally yeah. marketing to. Yeah. There's new generations entering the workforce, running these businesses. What it could be a generational business. You know, they're the owner's kids are taking over. It's a different type of generation. You have to make sure that you're kind of looking at it omni-channel too, and not just one particular method of the sales or marketing. Um, so we, you mentioned a little bit about going back to the giving back, and you know, you've started this. Um, live stream, I love it. Um, you know, it's it's weekly. It's MSP confidential. Um, why was that important to you to create something like that? I mean, that's a big time investment. It's a you know a commitment. You're not just doing it one time and expecting certain results. Like, there's a lot of giving back mm-hmm. that you're giving and a lot of knowledge that you're sharing. Why is that so important to you? Um, selfishly, I you know I say this on the live stream from time to time. I just wanted to hear some interesting people tell their interesting stories and um and get you know maybe create a bit of a platform for some of those stories to be heard um i think the more conversations we have and and by the way i think as i get older i'm getting more curious about things you know the the more i know the less i know type of thing and um and so i think it's it's just this interesting opportunity to learn from people that are doing some great things in their particular industries or msps or vendors or what have you um and uh yeah i just love having those conversations the the good news is on the flip side of having done now 20 21 episodes that are that are in the bag you know people have given me some really nice feedback be like hey, I I love your interviewing style, or, you know, that conversation with this person was great, they dropped some really cool knowledge bombs, and and so I think it's for those moments, and uh, it's tough to sometimes do this long format thing, because, you know, people have a limited amount of time, but but I feel like the long format is great, because you could be working, you put it on, you don't have to be watching the people having the conversation, but you can listen in, and there will be something that catches your eye, and if if you're tuned in, or if you're open-minded to some of these new ideas, sometimes it's like, oh, that's a super interesting way to maybe change the way we're marketing this or the way we're servicing that. Uh, and that's kind of this, this uh, interesting, you know, layer that I live in right now is I'm just always interested to hear what other people are saying and how that maybe can be transliterated or transformed into some other cool idea. Um, so I don't know. I was a little bit concerned with the weekly cadence of a live stream because it's a big commitment, not just from a time perspective, but, you know, having this, this slot every week that you kind of, your life has to revolve around was a little concerning and I initially wanted to do like a, a offline series entirely. So maybe I want, I could record three in one week and then we kind of post them. But, but what I realized is a lot of what happens in our industry is so time sensitive. So time, yep. And so I kind of really like, I have had to record a couple of them ahead of the actual day cause I was traveling or on a plane or whatever, but um, I won't do them more than two or three days ahead. Yeah. Like they need to be sort of in that space continuum of that week because otherwise like the, the context is lost, right? Um, like the perfect example of recording this morning with MJ for this Friday is we had the context of being at CCF. Like I recorded this two weeks ago yeah. and I had launched it the week after CCF was finished. Suddenly there's no, we had no discussion about CCF. There was no context about that. So I think those things are important to be sort of in the moment as much as possible. Oh, I agree. I mean, so important. And I listen to them. They're great. Um, the feedback, I mean, you mentioned Nick earlier, he listens to them. Um, I think, you know, just giving giving more than what you expect. Uh, I'm, I mean, that's, that's so important to me, just giving back and giving more in whichever way, because you never know how you can impact somebody, you know, what knowledge you can drop on them. Mm-hmm. And then from your perspective and mine, it's always learning. You know, always having an opportunity to learn. There's things that I learned from you. You learn from other people in the industry, and just feeding off of that is so so mm-hmm. important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, right back at you, man. Because like, I think again, it's the curiosity, right? Um, and, and I've started to realize that when when people rub me the wrong way, it's usually because they they pretend to know everything already. And um, this is a problem in our industry, by the way. Yeah. You know, MSPs have this this a bit of you know this knowledge complex. Um, and so it's a, t- it's a tough thing to sort of let the, c- the creativity and the curiosity take over and just ask more questions. Uh, who was I listening to recently? He was saying, um, yeah, just ask questions a little bit longer. You know, just stay curious a little bit longer and you'll find that you're, it's sort of a great listening exercise because uh, you'll just get a chance to dig in a little bit deeper on that thing the person was saying. You know, don't jump in with with having an answer all the time. Just let the person sort of talk through their ideas. Um, 
This is the other thing I think about my industry, our industry, is that we are in the public domain in many respects. And as a vendor, you know, I'm talking to MSPs all the time. Um, and as an MSP, when we get in front of clients, I think one of the things they expect us to have about our industry is confidence. But this is such a like a nuanced thing. And confidence comes from, you know, having said the words is one example I'll give you. And so the, the ability for us to have this conversation and throw around some ideas and, and literally say some of the words that we might be repeating to a, a customer in a different room at a different time, uh, it changes the way that you deliver that b- bit of information. And it, it shows in the confidence because I've said this before, I'm comfortable with the idea, I'm behind the idea, I'm fully bought into the whole philosophy of it. And now when I talk about it, you know, I can deliver it with this confidence level that my customer is going to be like, I believe you. And let's do that, right? But I think when MSPs don't spend enough time having conversations, um, you run into the situation where you, you kind of sit in and you're maybe hesitating about uh, asking the customer for the sale or asking the customer to sign off on the project. And and I think people detect that hesitation um, and, uh, and maybe push back. It's like, I don't feel mm-hmm. confident this is going to go well or whatever. You know, so I think it's just important to have conversations. This is why the community is so important, too. It goes back yeah. to that a little bit. I mean, being an active listener, to listen and not to respond is so important. I mean, to absorb what someone is saying. Because, yes, it's easy to be able to think that, mm. okay, I know all about, I know everything. I know about what they're talking about and then immediately tune out. But being an active listener is so important. And be there with the intent to listen, not to respond so that you can actually absorb and understand what someone's saying. That's how you can have a great conversation. But you talked, you said the confidence piece. I mean, I love that you went there. And, you know, we, we haven't prepared for this. This is just natural conversation for us. But the confidence factor, you know, I look at it as a scale. So you have to, if you have two parties, there has to be confidence on both sides in order to come to an agreement. So when I met my wife, I was 10 out of 10 confident that she was the right one. If she was one out of ten that I was the right, there was there was yeah, no, no agree- deal. There's no deal. Yeah. So you have to you have to build confidence with the others, and it is based on the knowledge. It is being an active listener, understanding what's happening, and be there as a real resource and value for your clients, for your people, whoever it is, your colleagues, your partners, so that you can raise that confidence level. Mm-hmm. Because unless you raise that confidence level of your clients, prospective clients, or partners that you work with today. They don't want to engage with you. You may be a 10 out of 10. Yeah, I'm, I am so confident. Like if getting you into the studio, I was 10 out of 10 confident. If you were at 1 out of 10, you wouldn't be here today. <laughs> so I raised your confidence level over time, and we're here today. But oh, the, man. the confidence is so important. Um, I've been listening to this really interesting guy, um, Chris Doe. Mm-hmm. Chris Doe is a creative um, that really sort of, uh, started to crack the code for growing a creative business. And um, and he puts out so much interesting content about, you know, having price conversations and, and literal, like, um, science of price bracketing and things like that. Because in the creative world, you know, I think the uh, things are a little bit more abstract in terms of the mm-hmm. tangible outcome of something, you know, designing a logo or designing a brand, that kind of stuff. And so it's super interesting to listen to him because I find that there's so many parallels with uh, how MSPs going to kind of relate to their customers in these conversations as well. And so he we recently put on a, um, a workshop in Vancouver, and it was a branding workshop, which I thought was a, a little bit different for what the kind of thing that I was looking for. But I went. And so I, I bought my ticket. I went. And it was absolutely fascinating because a lot of what's inside of the whole branding um, cog wheel, if you will, are all these things like listening, like conversations, like understanding how to talk pricing without sort of giving up all your space and all your, you know, your position of advantage. And, and I thought it was really, really interesting. And so there was, you know, a little uh, beer and drinks event afterwards. And, and to my surprise, he came and hung out with everybody. And we ended up sitting at a table very much like this, like five people just, you know, shooting the breeze about interesting life things. Um, and so one of the, and, and I'll, I'll get to my point uh, that I was going on this long tangent for, but one of the things that, that I discovered through his content after going in to look at some of his videos and stuff like that is he talked about this idea that it's not your job to be the best option. It's your job to be the least risky option. And so it was fascinating once I started thinking about it because I realized 
as MSP, sometimes we have this idea of like, if we're, if we're building fixed fee for a project, if we're building fixed fee for onboarding or any number of, of things, we want to try and big bang the heck out of it, be done with it and sort of move on to the next project. But in the client's perspective, that big bang could be really risky to their business, to their operations, to their flow, to their ability to just uh, adopt change or whatever it is. And we may not be considering this. And so when clients push back on initiatives or projects, it kind of dawned on me, it's like, holy heck, maybe the issue here is that they're just scared of the impact to their business of doing this in two weeks instead of sort of phasing out the project. So one of the things he talks about is that phased engagements tend to have a higher closing success rate simply because of the fact that it's less risky for the client to mm. a- accept that change and go through the process than this you know mammoth big bang of a project that you're going to finish in two weeks. I thought that was fascinating. And just like that idea, there are probably hundreds of videos on his YouTube page. Uh, and he's got a couple million followers on YouTube, half a million followers on LinkedIn. And he just constantly puts out super interesting content like this. And if you're curious and listening, you catch on to some of these ideas that are so interesting to go and chat, test in your own environments, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the fa- I thank you for sharing that. The phased approach, because uh, c- companies are going to make decisions based on risk oftentimes. You know, how much can they tolerate that risk? How much can they tolerate mm-hmm. that change? And they so, may not even know it, like, consciously in that moment. They mm-hmm. just It just feels uh, scary to like do too it. too big. Yeah, it's yeah. too big yeah. for us to take yeah. something like that on. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they wouldn't do something in a phased approach. So you're absolutely right. I mean, taking that type of approach, doing it in a more phased approach, being consultative, build their confidence as well over time um, can definitely yield yeah. better results. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So as we wrap up today, well, first off, we haven't had any tequila. So Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, I've been staring at yeah, it for I've been the staring last three you know, yeah, When are we going to interrupt the yeah, programming let, to let, have a little... Well, yeah. cheers. Thanks again for being in the studio today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I've got a... You shared with me at one point that, you know, you, you talked about it a little bit when, you know, pre-getting into the IT space and, you know, you're musician, but you actually toured with someone who is <laughs> somewhat famous that, uh, that uh, I'm sure our viewers would recognize. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I grew up in Colombia and um, I was a musician from, from my mid-teens. I kind of started a bit late. I remember going to the summer camp in Virginia. I, this is a bit of a backstory, edit as required. Um, I went to a summer camp in Virginia as a, a counselor in training. And it was the summer of 1989. And that was the year that Richard Marks put out Right Here Waiting. For anybody in our age bracket, everybody knows that what a hit that song was. And I was just obsessed with the song. And, and I, you know, I could kind of play around with the keyboard, but I didn't really know anything. And there was this uh, cook in the kitchen that was there from Russia or something for that summer who was like a classically trained pianist and had this incredible ear. And and I was she saw me sort of struggling to try and play this little melody. And she came out and she's like, oh, I've heard this song. And she literally just and played this incredible rendition right before my eyes. And this was, I, I feel like that was quite literally the inflection point is like, I'm obsessed. I, I want. I want to learn how to play the piano. This is. This is. There's nothing better. And I got back home and I was on my mom's case. I want a keyboard. I want a keyboard. I want a keyboard. A year later, for my birthday, she got me this little Casio keyboard, and uh, I even made my own little sustain pedal out of a like a foot, like a door switch, a, a doorbell switch, because uh, it's just a sort of a on-off contact. So uh, my friend uh, Richie, his dad had a little wood shop, and he helped me build a little stand for it. We put the little doorbell on it, and I put a plug on it. So for you know for five bucks, I built my own sustain pedal, and I now could play sustained <laughs> you know keyboard. Anyways. Fast forward, you know, high school rock band, and I, I was in this other band that was a ska rock band. We had, uh, we won some, like, radio contests and stuff like that, got some recording time, met some people in the recording industry, decided I want to kind of pursue music instead of industrial engineering. So I started industrial engineering. I did um, a few semesters of that, and then made the switch into a, a music with audio engineering emphasis uh, program that the university in Bogota had just launched. And in that program, I met uh, Juan Gabriel Turbay, who was the keyboardist for this band called uh, Polygamia, which is literally translated to polygamy. And uh, I know, you know, was it translated to polygamy? Okay. Uh, And so it's not seen as that. It wasn't about that. These were, you know, 15 year old kids at the time they started the band. Uh, But anyways, it's it's now a revered sort of uh, 
classic rock band from the from the 80s and 90s that a lot of people in Colombia um, hold very dear to their hearts. And he was um, the keyboardist for this band, but he was leaving the band and going to start a solo career. And we got to know each other, and he kind of brought me into the band. He suggested, hey, I think you'd be a great option to sort of take my place in the band. And he wanted to go explore his solo career and whatnot. And um, sure enough, you know, I, we started rehearsing with the band. He joined the band. We went to the studio. And in the studio, uh, we brought in uh, a producers, a bass player and guitar player, who were Shakira's uh, bass player and guitar player at who? the time. Uh, <laughs> Sergio Shakira. So yeah, Shakira. <laughs> uh, Sergio Solano and uh, Chato Rivas. These two guys, incredible players in their own right. Um, and they were sort of in this interesting snowball effect uh, period for Shakira and her career. She'd been really hot on the radio in Colombia for the last little while, but it hadn't really done anything internationally. Anyway, she had her own keyboard player, and but we, but Arnold, who was also, I took some lessons from him, he's a super jazzy player, and I really wanted to get in jazz and all that. He came in and played a, a guest piano track on one of the tunes with the rock band. And um, later that summer, Arnold sent me a page. I had a, one of those little Motorola pages. And he says, hey, man, um, I am really stuck... I, there was this last minute uh, three date thing that came up with Shakira in Ecuador and I can't go I'm tied down to this theater gig that's opening this weekend and it's just too soon I can't like sub out of it um, do you think you can cover me uh, in Ecuador and I was like sure man and uh, Shakira was dating the bass player in the rock band at the time so I actually knew her like she'd been to my house for my birthday that kind of stuff um, we weren't close or anything like that but, uh, but when I showed up at rehearsal she obviously knew who I was, but she didn't know why I was there. And then I realized, oh, shit, Arnold hasn't told her. And so when Arnold arrived, he was also late to rehearsal. He finally tells her. And I think the way that that all played out, Arnold was just never asked to come back to the band. Uh, and I ended up doing those three dates and then being called back for the rest of the tour. And uh, that was ended up being six months of touring as her career is blowing up in South America. Wow. So it went. It started with Ecuador, then we did uh, Peru, then we did Venezuela, then we had to do some uh, Central American concerts. Uh, went back to Peru. Um, then the crew started growing. Now we brought in some lights people that were like Argentina. We brought uh, a tour manager and roadies from Mexico, and sort of it was interesting to see sort of the growth of the entire process. Even, uh, and she was 19 at the time, so she was pretty young. Uh, her parents always traveled with her, but she was always super level-headed, very smart girl. Um, I was 22 myself, so I was, you know, much older. And I was rooming with Chato, who was the bass player, uh, and he was the band leader also. So um, I definitely got a lot of his wisdom, a lot of his experience, just through that experience of, of hanging out with him. And uh, He could keep the cool in any situation. Anyways... That was sort of six months of touring. We ended up sort of the season playing uh, at the Beacon Theater in New York. I have a funny story about that. We were hired, we were contracted by the promoter to do one show. And we'd finish the show, we go out to the dressing room, and the promoter comes in. Guys, this was great. It was amazing. How would you feel about doing another show? And everybody's like, oh, yeah, it'd be great to stay in New York a few more days. And he's like, no, there's enough people lined up outside the theater to, to turn it around and do another seating. Oh, wow. And so we're like, let's go, you know. And so we ended up doing a second seating that night at the Beacon Theater uh, in New York, which was incredible. And, uh, yeah, so anyways, I, I have so many little stories like oh. that uh, of just getting a chance to be at, on those types of stages uh, at that level. And, and, you know, at age 22, I feel like I got this thorn out of my side pretty early because I do see, you know, this desire for fame or this desire for a successful career kind of not play out necessarily for the majority of musicians mm -hmm. um, but it was kind of fun to do that it was an incredible experience and uh, I hold it dear to my heart wow I, I mean that is an amazing experience I mean sharing that for uh, for our viewers and you know that's really I mean we've talked about so many a variety of different topics today technical music everything you know people mm -hmm. but um, really it sums up for me, it's the music behind the MSP. You know, that's where you really you started. You started Sounds like off. a good slogan. Yeah, the music yeah. behind the MSP. I mean, I really appreciate you being in the studio today. Do you have anything you want to share for the for the audience? I think I'm going to run with that slogan. Yeah. You know, uh, listen to the music, yeah. and I think all the conversations you could you could sort of put them in the parallel of music and. 
and and everything if we are listening the right way it could be music to our ears i guess i'm I'm going deep on the theme here but um (laughs) you like that theme yeah (laughs) i think you've just uh, unlocked this whole marketing opportunity for me Uh, Mm. so that's funny yeah no listen to the music i think uh, it's just a good parallel to just being more curious and being more tuned in you know i appreciate the opportunity to have these types of conversations because i always learn something and uh, so thank you for, yeah. you know, having this space for others to also come in and have great conversations. No, so. thank you so much for being yeah. here. I'm so glad we were able to get it done. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, anytime you're in Chicago, you're always welcome oh, here in the studio. You. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers.